this morning really looking at that protection issue from a blast and ballistics and the engineering. And what I mentioned was that's really half the equation, the other half. And I, I think to some extent a bit of a poor cousin, if I may say, and I don't mean that poorly, but the second half being that of mobility. And uh, as I said, really it's the wheels. That's the only thing connecting the vehicle to the road. You know, if something goes wrong with that, you can have as much protection as you want. Uh, it's a different story. And um, as Alex said in the UN, and I know in my experience with the UN Department of State, they actually have more people injured and killed through road accidents than they do through blast and ballistic. And in fact, most of those people are in the African continent rather than other parts of the world. So it is a critical key importance. And we've just come out of uh, doing a job in two jobs, one in Somalia and one in Kenya. And the level of appreciation for even basic issues like the inf uh, inflation rates, levels of the tyres, the, uh, the condition of the tyre, the, the brake pads, um, uh, the springs and the, and, the, and the shock absorbers is very much a secondary issue. And what we want to do is try and promote that up so that there is a greater appreciation from a, a user's a, uh, specifications perspective, um, a, a user's, a fleet manager's uh, situation as well. So I'll hand over. I look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Rob. Is the mic on? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is uh, Leonard Alkemale from TSS International. Uh, I already see a lot of familiar faces for me, also some unknown faces, so please allow me to introduce myself. Um, and welcome to my presentation. Um, so my name is Leonard Alkemade. I will give you this presentation, as Rob mentioned already, uh, from um, several angles. Um, we have some people from testing facilities, uh, engineers, vehicle builders, end users, and suppliers. So I will focusing on several angles in my presentation. Uh, but first, a small introduction. I'm, uh, I'm Dutch, born in uh, Gouda, so cheese, cheese city. Um, I served in the Royal Dutch Army for 11 years. I was deployed in uh, Afghanistan a few times, Iraq and former Yugoslavia. Um, so a, a lot of experience in um, armored vehicles. Um, after that, I worked as a close protection officer and security consultant for nine years. And since 2018, more from a commercial and technical perspective, um, as business uh, development manager for TSS International. Um, today I will be um, hosted by uh, Theo Verbruggen, sitting in the room. He will be my sidekick today. He will also be present during the whole um, uh, event, if you have any additional questions. And just a short introduction of uh, Theo. Um, well, he started his uh, career in racing industry, um, specialized in, uh, in also in mobility in uh, uh, tires and suspension. And he has a lot of experience, and he'll, he also developed uh, the Maxxis uh, tire, which is being used for many uh, civilian armored vehicles. So if you have any specific questions about this topic, you can always contact uh, Fio. Short introduction about uh, our company, TSS International, founded in 1976, incorporated in 1999. We're just a small company, only 11 uh, uh, employees, not as big, big as uh, AGP, for example, but just a small company. Located in uh, Barendrecht, uh, the Netherlands, close to Rotterdam, a uh, member of uh, the NIDV, so it's the Dutch Association for Defense and uh, Security. Uh, Fleet Forum, I think a lot of you uh, know Fleet Forum. Uh, the ESTA, European Transport Asso Association, uh, registered to NATO, um, UN, and we are ISO certified. Just some uh, idea what, what we are doing. We are um, a supplier of uh, uh, heavy-duty brake systems, complete run flat uh, wheel assemblies, heavy-duty suspension systems, protected or self-sealing fuel tanks. Maybe you know the self-sealing fuel tank. This is our invention, and we own the patent for this. Uh, what we're doing right now, knowledge sharing tra and training. Um, we can support with design and uh, engineering. Um, and we also provide uh, vehicle intercoms. And one topic which is not uh, stated in this overview we also supply blast mitigating floor mats, but this is a different topic and I'm not zooming into this uh, right now. 
So um, what's our market, current market position? We uh, act as an integrator uh, between, for example, JRZ suspension, Skydex, Movit for the brake systems, and Hutchison for the run-flat systems. And we supply to vehicle builders, uh, sometimes to end users uh, for spare parts, but most of the time we, we respect our relation with uh, the vehicle builder. So most of, most of our product we sell to the vehicle builders. And basically we offer you a one-stop shop for armored mobility. A short hypothesis, um, what does me mobility mean to you? Because this is um, just a hypothesis. Um, our organization, this is more from an um, end user perspective, for an NGO for example. Our organization sets a, a clear program of requirements for our vehicles before the start of a mission. And I'm happy to see that also in the previous presentations, I've also seen a few similarities in my uh, with my presentation. Because for some people, mobility means this. And for some people, mobility uh, means this. So I think it's good that we know what we're talking about. But where do we start? Of course, and this is what I mean with the similarities with the previous um, uh, presentations, um, what, what is the purpose of the mission, the mission statement? In my opinion, this is the basis uh, on which you, um, for which vehicle you, it can be used. Um, as mentioned before, this is a detailed process, and something that, that's why I'm happy that um, you've organi organized this forum, uh, Rob, that um, um, this is a perfect platform to, to share knowledge and um, also to inform you about uh, possible innovations we have. Because sometimes it's difficult for government ag agencies to talk directly to, um, uh, to manufacturers or to suppliers. So what's the current threat level important? This is related to, for example, the protection level of your vehicle and for this specific uh, presentation, the, the, run, the run flat performance. Is there a quick reaction force or some backup available? This is uh, determining my self-rescuing uh, ability. Well, there are many um, sources where you can find um, information regarding security, but this is just, just an example. Um, you can find all kinds of information regarding uh, attacks on healthcare. Um, so do I um, move uh, individually or uh, in a convoy? And what resources do I have ha at my disposal? Uh, one specific topic I would like to mention is the qualified local workshop. I know that uh, for a lot of uh, end users, this is always an issue um, because everything is well organized in uh, at your office in our uh, in our workshop. But sometimes um, in in an isolated area, uh, is there a local workshop uh, available, and are they uh, certified, and do they have the correct spare parts available, and do we have a, a fleet manager who is able to support me uh, in this matter? What are we talking about? The, um, the Golden Triangle, the title of our presentation, is uh, three topics. The heavy duty wheel assemblies, heavy duty brake system, and heavy duty um, uh, suspension. But what are we exactly talking about? I mean, um, in a lot of tenders, there's often written uh, heavy duty, but what, what does heavy duty actually mean? Well, I just picked uh, two random uh, descriptions from the internet, and I underlined uh, two things for a long time at durability, uh, basically the same meaning. So the products need to um, withstand um, a lot of uh, uh, intensive use. Zooming in on the, the heavy-duty wheel assembly, this is one of our uh, heavy-duty wheel assemblies we have available. This one is for the LC300, existing of a heavy-duty rim, but is this tested and certified? And tested by whom? This is uh, very important. Uh, do we need um, uh, reinforced studs and nuts? I will come back to that later, because it's a very uh, actual topic at the moment. Um, if you would like to have um, a specific presentation about the wheel fasteners, so the, the, about the relevance of studs and nuts, uh, please contact me. I can send you a separate presentation about this. Uh, the run flat system itself, is this tested and certified? Is the run flat performance known? I don't know if everybody is aware what the run flat performance means, but this means uh, when you're uh, driving with a flat tire, how many kilometers are am I able to, uh, to drive? And according to which standard? 
and later in the presentation I will zoom in to uh, an example of a, a well-known standard in the market. Heavy duty tire, is the load index correct? For example, um, when, when uh, vehicle builders are building a VR9 certified vehicle, then we're talking about weights of around 6,500 kilograms. This means that the load index of the tire should be relevant, is very relevant because um, you're not allowed to uh, exceed the load index of the tire. Then the tire pressure, this is always an issue. Um, I underlined it, um, this should be recommended by the vehicle manufacturer when a vehicle uh, is be being delivered to you, um, he, he should be uh, advising you which tire pressure is ne necessary and mandatory. Well, this is an example of uh, the, the Maxxis tire we are using for many of our wheel assemblies. You can see an overview of, um, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see 6.5 bars, uh, which load uh, you are able to carry. And especially a lot of end users are not aware, or the drivers are not aware of the, load pr the, the, the tire pressure. Um, because this is definitely determining the actual um, uh, speed and safety. Well, just a few functions of the tire. Does the gross vehicle weight, the GVW, exceed the load index? I wrote 60%, 40%. Basically, for a lot of uh, SUVs, 60% of the load of the vehicle is being loaded to, to the rear axle. So this means when you, when you calculate the load uh, on the rear axle and on the specific tire, you, you, then you're able to uh, calculate um, the, the load which is able to, um, uh, for, 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 the, for the tire. Sometimes for smaller products, because the LC200, LC300 are very common platforms, but sometimes for smaller projects, um, customers uh, in the last phase of their project uh, contact us, do you have a wheel assembly available? And most of the time we're able to, to provide them with a wheel assembly, but the tire is always the weakest part of uh, the whole wheel assembly. Um, sometimes, uh, based on the, 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 the size of the wheel or the, or the platform, um, there's no uh, tire available because the, the weight of the vehicle is exceeding the, 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 the existing tires. We are able to test the tire at the TUV Germany, for example, but at some governments, uh, they don't accept it for the roadworthiness, uh, the homologation. Uh, they don't accept the uh, TUV cer certificate for this uh, load. However, the, uh, the testing for a higher load is uh, possible, as I mentioned, but of course, decrease the maximum speed. The tire is, of course, uh, mentioned uh, so without skidding, and is also pr uh, providing you comfort. Um, also able to uh, uh, absorb uh, impact, for, uh, potholes for example, a lot of um, armored vehicles are driving in very bad, uh, bad conditions. And under all weather conditions, this is something I, I uh, underlined, because um, some tires are only certified for uh, summer, um, and we also always recommend um, to install tires with all, able to serve on, under all weather conditions. As I mentioned, unfortunately, we quite often see that uh, because um, uh, vehicles being built, being armored, imperfection, then at the last uh, phase, th they're contacting us and please to deliver us the wheel assembly in within two weeks. And this is unfortunately uh, happening too much. I underlined here the operational weight because I just mentioned about the GVW, the gross vehicle weight. I pre personally, I prefer the operational weight because nowadays, um, mainly due to the situation in the world, a lot of um, bad situations um, are happening in the world, unfortunately. Um, for example, Ukraine, um, a lot of uh, um, Western European countries um, supporting Ukraine. Um, this is very good, of course, but they're not able to stay within Ukraine. They're driving from Warsaw in Poland, for example, on a daily basis to uh, Kiev. Uh, this is about 800 kilometers, and I think that nowadays, um, all the civilian armored vehicles are being tested to the maximum uh, with very, uh, very long distances. In Poland, the, ro the roads are very good, but in Ukraine, the roads are really bad, and the security teams are driving with high speeds on very bad road conditions. So uh, that's why uh, all those, those, all those uh, uh, security personnel is loading maximum um, uh, capacity of water and supplies, food, etc. So the, the, the original stated uh, gross vehicle weight is being exceeded 
This is why I prefer to focus on the, the operational weight. The rim itself must be able to withstand the dynamic load. So for example, if you're driving through a pothole, the dynamic load is uh, often be, being uh, exceeded. For example, the, the, the rim I showed you, we certified it for a payload to 2,250 kilograms to be able to withstand that. As mentioned before, I'm repeating it, the load index of a tire must be sufficient and the tire pressure must be sufficient to support the weight. No compromises by end users. Sometimes, because people are driving with very high speeds, we see that from a comfort level, people are lowering the tire pressure because it feels more comfortable. But this is n definitely not recommended. Then the correlation between the type of run flat and the tire size. For example, um, uh, one of our wheel assemblies, I showed you the, um, with the red arrow, uh, the space between the inside of the tire and the run flat system. For um, normal road use, we always recommend a minimum clearance of uh, one, one inch, so 2.54 centimeters. Um, but for um, off-road conditions, like the Land Cruiser, we recommend more space because when you're driving over a pothole, you're not allowed to make contact with the inside of the tire with the run flat system. As studs and nuts, as, as I mentioned, um, a lot of people are forgetting this very um, small piece of steel. There are only five of eight pieces of them, depending on the vehicle, of course, but they're crucial for, for your safety. Especially using an armored uh, vehicle, uh, centering, seating, and torque are essential. This, uh, of course, is uh, determining the, uh, the, the strength of the wheel, the accuracy of the seating, and the damage. Just a few pictures, what, what, we, what we also see is a conical bolt in a conical seat, and some uh, two examples how it not should be. Uh, the uh, brake system, uh, we always recommend uh, at least reinforced calipers and ventilated brake disc, as you can see uh, these, this brake disc ventilated, reinforced brake pads and steel braided brake lines. But this is tested and uh, validated by the vehicle builder and, uh, the, in terms of home legation. We always recommend the supply declaration and the uh, brake system for armored vehicle is not an upgrade of an existing brake system, but it's a specifically designed brake system. Well, of course, sounds quite logical, but it needs to stop the vehicle in a, the possible, uh, shortest possible distance. The heat energy is scattered into the atmosphere. That is why we recommend a ventilated brake disc to prevent heat buildup. This is why reinforced uh, brake pads are essential to prevent fading. And just as a reference, uh, the brake bias or brake balance, uh, just keep, please keep in mind when you have a vehicle of around five to, uh, to six, six tons, um, about 70 uh, to 75% of the vehicle weight is being used to do the front axle. So this is an, an enormous weight. Basically, uh, it's not a passenger car anymore. It's basically a small truck you're driving. Of course, it should work consistently well on good and bad roads, in all weather conditions, and few wearing parts. And of course, important, it must not disrupt the steering geometry. Well, the heavy duty suspension system, consisting of uh, a damper with a higher damping force to control the reinforced springs and the vehicle weight must inclu include uh, heavy-duty bearings. This is what, similar to what I mentioned just with, uh, regarding the brakes. A lot of weight is, is transferred to the front axle. Front and rear springs related to weight distribution and reinforced sway bars. And also the brackets and bushings to install the sway bars. Well, of course, the essential function of the suspension system the primary function is uh, to feel the passengers uh, safe and comfortable and to absorb all the vibrations in the car. Well, each vehicle builder uh, builds in accordance with its own specifications, which automatically means that there's a difference in each vehicle in terms of weight distribution between the front and rear axle and the driving behavior. 
It's therefore essential to determine an appropriate suspension system for that specific platform as early as possible. It should be developed in such a way as able to operate under the most difficult uh, the conditions. And I underlined it uh, specifically, this is why uh, there is no such thing as a VR7 or VR9 damper, because each vehicle has a different uh, characteristics. How do these three components relate? Well, for optimal performance, all these three components must function in harmony with each other. If there's no harmony, so there's no synergy, it will have a negative effect on driving performance and the operational availability. For example, low tire pressure. A sidewall blowout is an option. Driving with underinflated uh, tires reduces the endurance, the durability, degeneration, and increases the risk of puncture. And of course, with uh, lower tire pressure, there's a longer braking distance, altered road handling, risk of aquaplaning, higher fuel consumption. And what I mentioned before is the inside of the tire makes contact with the run flat system while driving over bumps uh, or holes in the road with also potential blowout. And also frequent and hard braking cre creates extra friction, therefore heat with a lot of accidents can happen. Just an example, low tire pressure causes uh, extreme uh, asymmetrical wear. And a lot of uh, all these problems can be solved relatively easily to ju just to check the tire pressure. A lot of, um, um, I'm just, I was talking about the Maxi tire, but I have seen also in the presentation from the UN, a lot of um, um, diff different types of tires. A lot of um, tire manufacturers, they also supply uh, supplies declarations about how to use um, uh, run flat systems in, in combination with uh, tires. Just some, uh, I was talking about studs and nuts. Just some um, symptoms of incorrect mounting of studs and nuts when um, clamping is too low torque is too high, or ru rusted bolts. This is, of course, a very dangerous situation, just a very small piece of steel, but it's, um, imagine yourself, you're driving with a very heavy vehicle uh, with about uh, 100 kilometers per hour, and one of the studs is breaking. Imagine what, what can happen to yourself or to other um, people on the road. I'm talking about friction coefficient. Just take a look at uh, the, the, the data we have here. This is a uh, research uh, we, we had with an uh, OEM. But this is similar to, um, to um, studs and nuts for armored vehicles. Um, so if you take a look at the bottom of the page, you can see uh, what happens after tightening the studs and nuts after five times and after about uh, 20 times. For example, changing uh, after a flat tire. Some a lot of people are using the same studs and nuts. Uh, imagine what, what, what can happen. So we always recommend to replace both studs and nuts after several. This is, uh, if, you're, if you are interested in this, I can send you a separate presentation about this. A few recommendations. Inspect uh, studs and nuts after mounting and uh, dismounting. And during service, replace them and always use a calibrated torque wrench, not an air pistol. Sometimes in a local workshop, you, you see the big air pistols, and definitely don't do, that. don't do this. This is really dangerous. Uh, we always, when we supply uh, wheels and studs and nuts, we always uh, send uh, recommended torque. It, it might be higher than the OEM uh, torque. Tighten by hand, of course, calibrated torque wrench. Just an example how to, how to tighten the, the studs not in a star, a star pattern and not clock, clockwise. What can happen with a non-reinforced or poor quality suspension system? Less or reduced braking uh, efficiency, tire wear, of course, resulting into, as mentioned before, potential tire blowout. Less or less handling of uh, and control, 
vehicle bounces excess excessively, feels uncomfortable and unsafe, and that's then when people might be able to lower the tire pressure again to feel more comfortable. Increase wear in other vehicle parts, for example, uh, several welds in the vehicle and joints. Uh, when being used extensively, uh, the result of the, the damper can also be leaking and, or sweating. Now, this le leaking can be a result of um, uh, overheating due to the change uh, uh, in, the, in the viscosity of the, the oil. And a high quality damper is filled with uh, high quality oil. This also prevents external factors from influencing the viscosity. As mentioned, due to the brake balance, heavy duty brake, um, heavy duty bearing is uh, essential. Just something to think about. Because um, um, I also spoke to some, some uh, other people here, um, manufacturers, uh, uh, purchases, etc. They're all well known with all the material. But then the question, my drivers are well trained and know the capabilities and limitations of the vehicles. And unfortunately, we see this quite often, is that um, especially within some NGOs, is that um, local drivers are being used. Um, and sometimes there might be some difficulties with training people, etc. And we always recommend people to have a proper training with an armored vehicle. Purchasing, just a small, I'm not going in too deep. Um, so a, pack of, a package of requirements is drawn up for government or NGO tender, but we sometimes we see contradictions or ambiguities. For example, this is a screenshot of a random uh, tender. You, you can see upgrade the braking system and upgrade the suspension system, but no explanation what does it mean or it has to be certified according to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This would definitely be a re recommendation from our side Please spend more time on putting up, setting up the program of requirements. Testing, obligation, and certification. Uh, some examples uh, regarding run flat systems. Quite often, you can see uh, this standard in um, in, in uh, uh, requirements. This is the Finibel agreement. This is a test standard for uh, wheel, wheel assemblies, where you can test uh, um, uh, the performance of the run flat system. This is a military standard, but also used for a lot of um, uh, normal vehicles. And um, um, the other speakers were also to, uh, informing about uh, the, the PAS standard, the PAS 301. It's basically the only standard, uh, as far as I know, uh, which is testing a uh, complete vehicle uh, regarding road word worthiness based on scenarios. So suspension, braking, cornering, and, and uh, the run flat performance. But of course, this, this does not, not replace any um, homologation. I think this is uh, important for a meeting like this. It's up to you as an end user to determine which uh, uh, criteria components must, must meet. Um, we have a lot of knowledge with each other. Um, and we would like to receive your feedback if we can improve something so um, please make use of this. Please contact us if you have any questions or remarks. We're always available uh, to have a discussion. It was most You're interesting and, uh, <clears throat> and again, I think you are a bit of a poor cousin in this whole exercise, yeah. which is a shame, and I think bringing it to the surface is important. I'll, I'll relate just how important it is from a, my own experience. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice. Um, I, um, I had a fleet of vehicles in Islamabad in Pakistan and got a call one day from our regional security officer. We've got a rollover of a vehicle travelling down a freeway uh, outside of Islamabad. It was actually built by an Australian road company, <laughs> and the vehicle rolled over fell over into the ditch, we want to do a crash investigation. No problem. So organised, sent a team over to do a proper crash investigation and worked our way back through and found that the cause of the sequence of events was driver's pre-mission 
not checking the condition of tyres, something we see constantly around users and fleets around the world. As a result of not checking the condition of the tyre and the tyre pressure they were driving, they came in connection with some road debris, um, there was a blowout and the vehicle went off the side of the road and rolled over. And the interesting part is that the occupants of the vehicle uh, walked away. The front passenger was injured only because the jack to hoist up the, the vehicle in the rear cargo area was not secured and it flew forward as a missile and hit the man, thankfully not too hard, but hit him on the head and he was injured. So it verifies the issue of the integrity of these mobility components, the requirement of users and fleet managers to check them on an ongoing basis and to make sure that when they go into the servicing, that the servicing department, the, the workshop, the authorised, so to speak, workshop in the field is competent to be able, to, firstly, in understanding the importance, the configuration, the fitment, and how and when to therefore replace um, those parts. It is critical. You can spend 150000 on the most fantastic ballistic and blast protected vehicle, but if your brake pad or your tyre and your training of your operators in the field is not up to scratch, it can all be for nothing, so to speak. So just some personal experience. Uh, do you have any questions from the floor? No? OK, yes, there we go. I might give you a permanent uh, uh, possession of the microphone. <laughs> I, I will be quiet next time. <laughs> uh, no, no, thank you. Um, I have just, uh, so I'm not an expert with this, but, but uh, my question is, you showed that uh, you go with different pressures depending on the, on the payload or on the weight of the car. Correct. And um, the, um, the distance that the uh, run flat system can go after an incident, is it influenced by the pressure or is it independent from that? Uh, uh, very good question. Um, as, as mentioned, the tire is, is basically the weakest part of, of the wheel assembly. Um, the, the run flat performance is de determined by, uh, of course, the way the driver is driving. Uh, for example, is he driving on tarmac or is he driving on sand or gravel? Um, temperature, because uh, if it's really hot outside, the de degeneration or the devulcanization of the tire is, is, is going faster. Uh, but the most important thing is the vehicle weight. Uh, for example, um, just in a random example, a VR9 vehicle, um, average uh, weight of the VR9 vehicle is 6.5 tons. Uh, this means 60% load on the rear axle means around 1,900-1,950 kilogram wheel load. So this is a huge load. Um, um, depending on the height of the run flat system, determining how, f how far the tire is, is, is bending outside. So um, this, uh, when the, uh, the lower the run flat system, the lower the, the run flat performance. Mm -hmm. So if you have a high run flat system, then you're able to drive a longer distance. I hope this is answer your, answering your, your question. For example, the Finibel standard, uh, as, as, I, as I was telling you, is based, based on uh, driving with, with a, a flat tire. The first three kilometers of this 100 kilometer is based on uh, getaway speed or escape speed, so without 80 or 90 kilometers, then 22 kilometers with um, 50 kilometers per hour, and then 75 kilometers uh, with um, 25 kilometers per hour. This is, a, this is just a, a, a setup. We always test this at the ATP testing facility in Germany, and we drive in, a, in, an, in, an, in an eight corner ring. Um, I'm happy that I'm not doing this because it, it will take a few hours. Um, but this is just a way to test it, to have some kind of evidence how the wheel, including the tire, is, is, uh, and the run flat system is, is performing with a flat tire. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation today. Um, I just wanted to highlight um, the past part that you mentioned again, yeah. really, just to emphasize um, how important it really is. We talk about testing the vehicle for ballistics and blast, but again, we hear that the majority of injuries are caused through accidents. Correct. And there are many mechanical failures that happen in armored vehicles where people get injured. Um, but very rarely does ever any, any tender that I see or any requirement ask for a vehicle that's been past certified or past te tested in accordance with PASS. 
um, and this is probably equally as important as the um, blast and ballistic tests. Um, certainly at Mahindra, we've been testing pass, we've been testing all the suspension systems, all the different braking systems to work out a configuration. And there has been numerous failures with, with many products that a lot of armored vehicles actually use. And there's been some very surprising results with regards to the OEM brakes on the uh, TLC 300 that have been performing very well. So I think it's, you know, people really ought to look at using pass a lot more on their vehicles. Um, and end users should be asking if that vehicle has been tested. I just wanted to highlight that a little bit, a little bit louder. Well, I, I, I fully agree with you. And we had one presentation specifically focusing on, on the VPAM standards. This is all very well described. And I fully agree with you because I think a few years ago, uh, PASS was only used in, in the, uh, specifically in the UK region. And, and what, what we are seeing that slowly, like an oil stain, uh, many, more and more countries are, are uh, adopting this. And I'm, I think I think I can only rec recommend this. Um, and of course, if you have any issues with the LC three hundred, we can always assist you. So, uh, Thank you. yeah. All right. And just to add to that too, <coughs> excuse me. Is I recall that there was some tests done. I think actually through Oliver Flanagan in London um, some years ago in relation to the vehicle mobility characteristics once the vehicle had particular tyres deflated and therefore running on the run flats. And so it's not just a case of one tyre mm -hmm. being deflated, but what happens if you have the front left and the rear right, or the front left and the rear left tyres are deflated? How does the vehicle then perform? And this was an issue of, of consideration. And on top of that, um, and it transcends to the issue of driver training, in that many cases driver training is limited to the vehicle in its optimal condition rather than the vehicle in its non-optimal condition, particularly with uh, uh, tyres deflated and therefore trying to manoeuvre in an emergency situation away from danger with the tyres the in that deflated condition. So, um, again, it just highlights this important aspect as it does from the braking system and... Um, we were talking yesterday, might have been at lunch, and how people are reacting with their vehicle if the brakes are not necessarily functional, even if they are, but using the gears of the vehicle in order to act as a braking component of the, uh, for the vehicle, particularly running downhill where people might run in neutral or their foot off the accelerator and then start to apply their foot onto the brake and sooner than later the brakes will overheat, you're going to have a catastrophic issue. Correct. And many drivers still don't quite understand or appreciate. And in fact, the vehicle mobility performance is as much, relatively I'm saying, relatively speaking, the quality and the coordination and configuration of the components as it is the driver who's actually driving that particular vehicle. And he might have the best components, but if his driving skills are not adapted accordingly, then that presents another risk to, to the mobility of the vehicle.